Ion 17. Um, thank you. <laughs> Sound like a train was coming through. <laughs> John chapter 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. We're beginning in uh, verse 6. Last week, we considered the first five verses as Jesus prayed for himself. And we talked about God's amazing sovereignty in, in securing the salvation of his people. The people that... The Father has given to the Son. And that's why Jesus came, to secure our salvation. And we talked about election last week and what that means for us as Christians. Just what it means uh, to, to be in Christ and to have that fellowship with him. Now we continue on. And Jesus is praying primarily for the apostles that are there with him. But this extends out to all of us. Again, you'll see that next week as Jesus says, I'm not just praying for these guys, but I'm praying for all my people across the ages. So while he's praying um, specifically for the apostles, the principles apply to us as well. So John chapter 17, beginning in verse six, I want you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you had given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. May God bless the reading of his word. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you as we come before your precious word, Lord. We do so with awe and great reverence and understand our our um, lowliness, Lord God. And we just pray that you would be exalted as, as we come before you. And I pray that we would be truly engaged in our hearts and our minds, Lord God, that by your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate our hearts and give us understanding and bring conviction where there needs to be conviction, Lord, encouragement where we need to be encouraged. Equip us, Lord, to do the works of service that you've given to us, Lord God, that you may be honored and glorified. Again, please be with me, your servant, Lord. Give me your words to speak. Um, Lord, please um, may, may this time be to your glory and, and to our good. And I pray in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Praise God. As followers of Christ, <clears throat> the world that these guys find themselves in and the world that we find ourselves in and, and, it, and very unfriendly, even more unfriendly uh, than it had been to this point. And we know that from reading the book of Acts. As they go out with the gospel, you see what happens. You see the implications of what it means to be a Christian and living faithfully in this world and proclaiming Christ. It's difficult. It's hard at times. And we're entering into those times, I think, as his people. And, and it's somewhat frightening. It is. And these guys are scared. They're, they're, they're frightened uh, to a great degree. And that's why Jesus, beginning in the end of chapter 13, um, and... And, and, and going on through chapter 16 is really um, giving them comfort 
uh, right? I'm with you. The Holy Spirit's going to be in you. And you're going to go forth in my power. I'm, you know, I'm sending the comforter. All these promises, all the hopes, assuring them that they will meet trials and difficulties and persecutions as a result of belonging to them. But at the same time, he's promising to be with them. And he's with us to comfort, to strengthen, to encourage, to do the things that you can never do on your own, that you would never think of doing, you're able to do. And you do it because of his faithfulness to you. So we speak the truth in love, come what may. Amen? Praise God. That's who we're called to be, and that's what we do for Christ. So this is the high priestly prayer. You know that. We talked about that last week. Um, he prays especially for his apostles, but there's application for all of us, as I said a little bit earlier. And, and as a high priest, and you know this, most of you know this, one of the functions that he did was, would, would be to pray for the people for the people of Israel, for God's people. He would intercede on their behalf. So he's coming on, on behalf of Jackie and Mo and Andy and, and praying uh, for us before the Father. He's interceding on our behalf. So he prays for Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, James, the son of Elpheus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. And, and on their behalf, he comes to the Father. So we're just going to walk through the text. So please, um, we'll, we'll just go straight through and, and think about the implications. Verses 6 through 8. I've manifested your name to the people that you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and now they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they've received them, and they've come to know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Amen. Praise God. What Jesus is telling, and, and just, just acknowledging right now up front, he begins by stating the fact that he has faithfully executed his mission, right? To secure the salvation of all whom the Father had given to him. Praise God. That's why he came. He didn't make come just to make salvation possible for everyone, but to secure the salvation of all of those whom the Father had given to him, as we talked about last week. He says he gave them the words, the gospel, the teachings. They received them, right? When he told them, he, he took them and they took it to heart. They've come to know him. They believe in him. And what Jesus is saying there is really a composite of authentic Christian faith. You know, our faith consists really of, and you know this, of, of three things, basically. First of all, it's knowledge, right? People need to know. They need to hear the truth. They need to know the content of the faith. What do you as Christians believe anyway? What is the gospel, right? What are the teachings of your faith? That's the content of faith. People need to know that. That's why we evangelize. That's why we tell people about Christ. That's why we answer the questions. That's why we do apologetics. That's what we do. We give them the content of the faith. So there's knowledge there of what we believe, what the truth is. And then it also requires a sense. It means accepting or coming into agreement um, that it's factually accurate, right? So you talk to people, you have friends, family members, co-workers, and they'll say, yeah, I believe that Jesus was a, a real person, and I believe he, he was born of a virgin, and, and, and he was crucified, and he died for sins, and they could, they could you know, uh, assent to that. But that's not true faith. That's not saving faith, right? That's, that's, that's two, but... but you ultimately, because right, like even the demons know that he's alive and they shudder. They believe these things. They know these things to be true, but they're not trusting. So the third aspect is trust, believing, receiving, resting in Jesus Christ. And that's by his grace. That's by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's when he, he changes us. So there's repentance, there's faith, and there's transformation that comes through in your life. You're not the same person that you used to be. You weren't that person you were a moment ago before you were converted to Christ. Now you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, man. Everything changes. Your whole perspective, your worldview. And that, that's called our sanctification. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's what happens, right? Our allegiance is now to Christ and to God. Not to ourselves, not to the world, but to Christ, man. That's a big deal. It's a big change. So we're receiving and resting in him. It's like, like the chair illustration. You guys know this. I've taught it. You love it. You, you've seen it before many times. I could tell you about this chair. I could tell you all about it. Give you all the facts. It'll support your weight. Here's how it's made. I'll give you the content of, of how this thing is construct. I couldn't do that, but the person that made it could, right? And you could, you could trust us to sit in it. So, and you can assent to that. You could say, that's right. I see it. It's good. I believe what you're telling me. I'm sure it is. It's a wonderful chair, and that's wonderful and great. But what has to happen ultimately that you could be sure that it's going to support your weight, that it's going to work for you, that 
that it's going to be there for you. You need to sit in it. You need to trust. You need to rest in that chair. I'm glad it didn't break and I fall on the ground. That would have been not oh, hurt too well. But that's the idea. And so Jesus is saying that. I've given them your believe it. They know it. And they believe it. And they trust in me. So verses 9 and 10. And check this out. He goes on to say, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. That's so amazing. Check this out. As high priest, our Jesus intercedes for his own. Not every single person. You see the distinction that's being made. It's not just out there for everybody. He's not just praying willy-nilly for. He is praying specifically for his people. For his elect. For the ones who God has given to. For the ones whom he secured salvation. Uh, for. So there's that distinction. And check this out. That's a great benefit. You need to understand this, man. That's a great benefit that belong, be belonging to Christ is for us. That's wonderful. It's an amazing source of blessing and comfort and confidence and assurance, isn't it? To know that Christ is praying for you, that he's interceding before the Father right now for you and for you and for you, everyone who belongs to him. The world doesn't know that, man. They don't have that, that peace, that comfort, that confidence. They're, 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 they're on their own. We belong to him. We've been purchased by his blood, saved from the wrath of God, reconciled, justified, adopted into his family, forever his, a love from which nothing can separate us from. Amen? Praise God. And he's praying for us on his side. Again, if people are alone without Christ, they don't have this. They don't have this benefit. He says, I am praying for them. And check out verse 11. Look at the petition. I'm no longer in the world, but they're in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, here it is, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He begins, there's two things here. Number one, he says to keep them. Keep them, right? And that's a wonderful word. It's so rich. Tereo in the Greek. And, and, and it means to, um, to guard, right? Don't you love to be guarded? Don't you love to be protected, to be watched over? That, 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 that you're secure in that. That's, like it's a shield, right? And, and, it, and it means to preserve. And we call this in, in theology the perseverance of the saints. That we're going to persevere because he preserves us. We're not going to lose our salvation because it's not ours to lose. He's given it to us and he's not going to let us go. Right? So we have that confidence in him. And he's saying this. So this is big picture perseverance of the saints. And so we're not going to lose our salvation. But also it speaks to the everyday aspect too. Um, we have some young kids here. When, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're crossing the street with one of your young kids, especially a busy street or any street, but especially a busy street, what do you say to the child? Take my hand, right? So they'll take your hand and they're kind of holding on to you, but you're really holding on to them, right? They're, they're, they'll, they'll, grab, they'll grab your hand, but you are holding them tightly when you cross that street to make sure that they're going to be okay. That's the idea here. When he says to, to, to keep them, it means to, to shield, to protect, to guard, to preserve them right? with that love. And that's what he does for us. And he goes on and he prays for their unity. He checks out and says that they may be one. And that's so important for us as followers of Christ. That they may be one in purpose, in spirit, in mission. That we're united to Christ. That we need, we need to have the same goal, the same focus, and then act accordingly. Okay, that's a situation that we, we need that unity around the word of God. Because one thing that has potential, there's a lot of things that, that potentially disrupt the unity in the body. You know that. But one thing is trouble, man. Once we get into trouble, once trouble comes, the stress involved in facing difficulties, you have trials and persecutions, that can cause a lot of division and a lot of strife even among us. Doesn't it? It does that. And Satan knows that. So we need to be united in our minds and our spirit. I mean, on a small scale, it's kind of the mask thing, but I'm not going to get into that this morning because you have a little bit of division on there because the government intruding too far. But a really good example from Christian history on this idea of when trouble comes, it can cause trouble amongst us. We need to guard against that. We need to stay united in the faith when the difficulties come. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned this before in a previous sermon, but it's worth it, worth it again because it's a great illustration of this. In the year 250 or around 250 A.D., 
the Roman emperor at that time required, put out an edict, and he required everybody to sacrifice to the pagan Roman deities. You could choose your deity, but and you could also worship your god, but you had to worship one of the deities from, from Rome. And then once you did that, you would get a certificate. So that would show that you did that. So when it came to the Christians, the, the response of the Christians, first of all, it should be no brainer for us as Christians, right? You would think that. You would think, you know what, that's another God they're telling me to bow down to. First commandment, I'm not, no way, right? But that's not how it goes. We still struggle with sin in our own hearts, but we need to be united in this way. Jesus prayed for their unity. Because what happened is you had several different responses from the Christians at this time. The first response was that people took the edict, said, hey, we're going to sacrifice. Romans 13, we're going to obey the government. I don't really mean it in my heart. Jesus is my only say, but I'm going to do this to avoid trouble from the government. And, and that's what they did. So you had Christians that went along and, and they, they bowed the knee to, to the Roman deity and got their certificate. The second group endured persecution for a time. And they were brave for a time. And I want you to put this in our context today because we're on the precipice. Or we're real close to this kind of thing in our own lives and decisions that we're going to have to make that have these kinds of implications for us as Christians. I know we're shaking our head. It's really been unprecedented for us as Christians living in America to this point. But, and I'm not a prophet, I'm not a, you know, saying that, but it seems that we're coming to that place where this kind of thing it seems almost imminent, right? It's, it's all right there. And, and so the second group, they, they started out okay. And they didn't offer sacrifice, man. They didn't do it. I'm not going to, to offer sacrifice to a pagan god. Well, they were persecuted. So the government came in and, and, and they lost their jobs. Um, their, their homes were taken away. They would be put in prison for not doing this. So, so under that weight of persecution, they gave, they, they gave in after a while. You know, how would you feel if somebody came and said, okay, you're fired from your job because you're not doing this little thing. All you have to do is just, you know, acknowledge this and, and, and you'll be okay. You can still have your Jesus, but you still need, okay, so is it worth losing everything, man? I mean, you know, your job, your, your home, your livelihood, maybe being put in jail, right? That, that kind of thing. So, so they, they succumb to the pressure. And, they, and then there was the third group. And this is the group we want to be in, right? They said, no, it doesn't matter. We're not going to bow the knee to Baal. We're not going to worship your gods. You, we, we serve our God only. You shall have no other gods before me. And they meant it. So they didn't do that. And they lost everything. And, and there was strife even among the Christians because people in the first group are saying, oh, come on, you guys, you're losing everything. Just, you don't really need to mean it in your heart, right? Just do it to stay out of trouble. So you could see even that division within the, within the ranks. But they didn't bow the knee to bail and they did lose everything and they did. Christians were, persecuted. Christians were killed for this. So the persecution ends. And now those Christians that did bow the knee wanted to come back into the church. What would you do? So you have Christians over here that gave it all. They gave their lives for this. And now others want to come back into the church. And, and you have two church fathers. They have different perspectives on this. One was Cyprian, early church father. And he said, yes, we let them back in the church. They repented. They will do penance. There's contrition. We bring them back in the church. Another church father, Novation, said, no way. No. You, they, they gave in. They People died because of this. And now these guys want to come back? No. So there was a split in the church. You'll learn more about this in our church history class. But that's what happened. And and so um, Cyprian's kind of won the day in that, in that regard anyway. But, but you see that Jesus is praying for unity. You need to be one. Make them one. Especially when the difficulties come. Because it's so easy for us to, to, to be pitted against each other. Even if we're on the same team. Like I said, even these Christians, they were on the same team. How could you do that? How could you lose your whole family? Why would you give everything up just for this silly little thing, right? So, so you had that. He prayed that they would be one according to his word. That they respond to trouble, to persecution biblically. So he's praying for that. And then verse 12, he goes on to say this in terms of accomplishing his, his ministry. He says, I've kept, while I was with them, I kept them in your name. 
which you've given me. I've guarded them, and there's no language again, not, not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture may be fulfilled. So again, he kept his own, he guarded his own, and I was praying for them to the father, and he didn't lose Judas. Because Judas never truly belonged to him. And that's, that's what this, this says. Judas' rule in redemptive history was to betray the Savior. That's it. That, that was the, the, the plan of God from all eternity. <coughs> Judas acted very freely in, of his own volition. And yet he was fulfilling scripture. And we go to many of them. But just one, Psalm 41 says this. My, even, and this is a thousand years before Christ. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Verse 14, he says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. He's given them the word, and as a result of that, when the word is preached, you receive it, you become a Christian, that's gospel transformation. Guess what? The world's going to love you, man. They're going to embrace you. They're going to take you in. You're going to fit right in. They're going to want you. No. no. The world is going to hate you. Why? Because we confront the world with the gospel, with the truth of the gospel. That's why. Because we confront the world with their need of the very one they so vehemently despise and reject. So check this out. The more closely you follow Christ, the more f closely we follow Christ, the more distance the world wants to create between us and them. That's it. That's just it. The more distinct we are in our faith, the more faithful we are to our faith, the more you can expect to have conflict with the world. In the midst of this, look how Jesus prays. And I want you to see this in verse 15. Check it out. He says this. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That's another petition he brings up. This is his intercessory prayer. He's praying for them. He's praying for us. This is good. We need this. This is where our comfort comes from, our courage, our encouragement to carry on as Christians. Check it out. Why, why does he leave us? Why doesn't he just transport us to heaven? <laughs> just take us. Maranatha, come quickly. You know, it's a dispensation. I'd be like, where's the rapture? Come on. Give me, let's, let's go. You know why? Because as Christians, as a Christian, you have work to do while you are here. You have a purpose to fulfill. Right? And it's not, I'm, I'm just going to break this to you right now. It's not about living the American dream per se. Now that doesn't mean we don't pursue good job. doesn't mean we don't pursue family. That's all in the context of, of God's providence. That, that's, that's good. But your goal, your chief end, Christian, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And be will, ready and willing to lose everything else for the cause of Christ. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to give it all up for the cause of Christ? Because we do have work to do. We have a mission to accomplish as his people in the world. That's our purpose. That's our chief end. To glorify Christ. Not simply to have a family, leave things. That's all good. That's well and good. But ultimately, you want to stand before him and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You are willing to leave everything in order to follow me. You are willing to give it all up in order to be faithful to me, no matter what the cost. That, that's that's our spirit. That's why we're here. That's why he said, don't take them out of the world. Don't do that. Because they have work to do while they're in the world. That's preaching the gospel. That's living faithfully to Jesus Christ. Right? It comes through in our witness, in our testimony, and in our life. I'm going to read a couple excerpts from John Kelvin's book. We used to have this on the book table. It's so worth getting, especially since it's free. It was free. I think we still have some more copies. But um, the portion I want to read from is Calvin's talking about self-denial in the Christian life. And I want you to hear these words. Calvin says this, We're not our own. Therefore, neither reason nor our will should dominate our plans and actions. We're not our own. Therefore, let us not make the gratification of our flesh our end. We're not our own. Therefore, as much as possible, let us forget ourselves and our own interests. Rather, we are God's. Therefore, let us live and die to him. We are his. Therefore, 
Let his wisdom and his will govern our actions. We are his. Therefore, let us in every way in all our lives run to him as our only proper end. Let then our first steps to be abandoned ourselves that we may apply all our strength and obedience to God. When I say obedience, Calvin says, I don't mean giving lip service to God, but rather being free from the desire of the flesh, turning our minds over completely to the bidding of the Spirit of God. Amen. Praise God. That sums up when Jesus, don't take them out of the world, he says. But protect them from the evil one. Because you know what? While we're here, we have an enemy. We are vulnerable and, 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 and he's a very real and dangerous enemy. Look at verses 15 through 19. I don't ask them that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Again, there's so much there, but let's go through it um, rather quickly this morning. That petition, keep them from the evil one. So you have a Savior right now that's praying for you to be protected. Remember how... Peter, Jesus said, Satan wants to sift you. He wants you. He wants to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. He's praying for us. Right? Satan, in a sense, wants to sift us. And he is praying for us. Never forget that. Keep that in your mind and on your heart and your soul. You're not in this alone. You're not going through this by yourself. He is interceding. And, and we have strength in him and through his spirit. He kept them. Keep them from the evil one, especially from his influence, temptations, accusations, from adopting a worldly perspective. That's that's so important. That's a, a really good example of that in the church today is all the critical race theory and social justice that's coming into the church, man. And so many Christians are buying in. We're buying into that. We can't do that. That's a, that's a subtle deception. It's not so subtle anymore, but that's a deception. That's a worldly perspective that you're bringing to the church and putting over scripture and saying, here's how we have to handle certain peoples in this way, instead of what the scripture actually teaches. So, so, so we need to be careful about that from, from capitulating and compromising with the culture. We are distinct. Don't get too comfortable in this world, man. Please don't. Because it's so easy just to go along, to get along, to stay out of trouble, to love the things of this world. Again, it's not that we can't enjoy, but always understand that we can't be overwhelmed by this world. And are you ready to give it up? Are you ready to lose it all for the cause of Christ? We need to wrestle with that. We need to be understanding that he's, he's cleverly disguised deceptions that make sin so, so tempting to us, right? That makes sin so appealing to us. Be, be aware of that. As Paul says, we're not unaware of Satan's schemes in 2 Corinthians. He says, keep them by your word. Sanctify them in your truth. Not the third big thing. First of all, we're given to them. Second of all, we persevere. And the third thing is, we're being sanctified. Do you know what that means? That means we're becoming more and more like Christ by the power of his spirit. It's progressive sanctification. We're putting off the old man. You need to be putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Are you? Is your life looking more and more like Christ? Or are you going the opposite direction? So he says, sanctify. Your word is true. We're sanctified by his word. That means we read his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. We listen to it. We come to understand it. And we live it out. That's it. The problem is we don't want to do that too much. Huh? We want to go the other way. We want to go our own way. So we, we need to understand that. So he says in Ephesians 4, 14 and 15, the word says this. So that you might not be... Um, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. That's our sanctification. We're growing up in him. Um, Ephesians 5, I'm going to just read a, a little bit from, from chapter 5 in Ephesians, if you want to turn with me, just, just to bring this idea into sharper focus. So Ephesians 5, if you want to turn with me, just beginning in 1. And so we talk about your word is truth. Sanctify them in, in, in truth. What's that look like, man? What's that look like? It looks like this. It's simple enough to understand. The question is, are we living that? Are we doing that? So in uh, chapter 5, 
beginning in verse 1. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as, as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering, the sacrifice of God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among those as proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness of, nor foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. See, put off, put on, right? We don't just put off, well, I'm not going to say that anymore, but we replace that with, with the truth. Because for this you may be sure that everyone who's sexually immoral or impure, who's covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you're the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. This is this is progressive saying to be. This is what it means to be to be a Christian this way. This is what it looks like. Walk in, in, as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right and true. And try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. All right? Don't go along with it, but shine the light of truth on. Don't just walk away and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. Here's why I'm not going to do that. Because it's wrong and that's sinful. Shine that light. This is what this means. So it's not some big mystery. It's not some big, oh, holy, you know, mysterious thing that we can't get our... our sanctification is this. It's becoming more like Christ. It's just It's living according to the word, which we are able to do as Christians by the power of the Spirit. So he says, take no part and said, expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything's exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible to the light, Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Huh? That's it. That's what Jesus is saying here. This is what, this is what it looks like to, to be in Christ. Colossians 2.8 says this. See to it that no one takes you captive. By philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So whenever you hear something, whenever you hear a philosophy, whenever you hear a teaching, when everybody's trying to tell you something, what do you compare it by? Mm -hmm. The word, man. It does it line up with scripture? Right? And if it doesn't, no. Right? And we need to point that out. That, that's what that means. And it goes on, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish argument every every um, presentation that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. If you take that to heart, you're going to be in good shape. If you take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, the obedience of his word, we're going to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. That's what he's saying here when he says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. We are kept from the evil one in large part through our sanctification. Because as we become more like Christ, as we become more like him, we're better able to deal with our adversary. Right? Just as Christ did. That's what he's saying here. And that's what he's praying for. So check this out. The prayer contains at least three great doctrinal truths that are there for us as Christians. Please take this to heart. Number one, our election unto salvation. That we belong to him. Right? And we were chosen before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. Christ came and by his blood. We are sealed. We are saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Right? We're redeemed through his blood. Secondly, perseverance. As he keeps us from falling away, he protects us. He protects us now and until he sees us safely home into the kingdom. That's a promise. That's, that's a word. Praise God. That's what you have if you're a Christian this morning. You're in Christ. You're securing your salvation. You're not going to fall away because he's going to keep you. And every day he's guarding you. And then our sanctification. Growing in maturity. Are you growing up in Christ, man? Are we, are we becoming more students of the word? Are we understanding it? Are we just kind of stagnant or going down? I mean, you know, I mean, we we're going to have our ups and downs a little bit in the Christian life for sure. But there should be progress to becoming more like Christ. You're not that person you used to be if you're in him. So why are you still acting that way? Hmm? Dying more and more to sin and to self that we may live more fully for him. Jesus prays for these things. He intercedes on their behalf. He intercedes on our behalf. Let us be ever mindful of this and then live our lives accordingly, faithfully, consumed by Christ, courageously and confidently. For the days are 